Our first discussion this evening will deal with the problem of aesthetics. And I suppose there is no matter under greater controversy in the world of culture today. Aesthetics, essentially, is that part of philosophy which is the concern with the nature of the beautiful. How shall we define beauty? In what way shall we establish the consequences of beauty as a vital force in the experiences of mankind? How shall we define that which is not beautiful and determine, if possible, the consequences of beauty and that which is not beautiful upon the daily experience of human beings. Even the most conservative of our modern dictionary are in general agreement as to the meaning of the word beautiful. And they all agree that to be beautiful a thing must be essentially noble, that it must be harmonious, that it must convey a lofty feeling to those who behold it. In other words, to be considered beautiful, a thing must have artistic value, a value which can be readily comprehended and experienced by those without special technical knowledge of the subject. Therefore, a thing that is asymmetrical, deformed or distorted in its parts, cannot be regarded as beautiful. If we go further into the study of the word art, or to that area of knowledge which we call the art, particularly the graphic art, we come also to a rather severe and definite definition, namely that art is concerned with the cultivation and the recognition of beauty. There seems to be no doubt as to the general intention that aesthetics is expressed through the creative art should be a means of enriching the experience of man in the acceptance and appreciation for that which is essentially noble, pure, fine, good, and in all of its parts and relations, colors, and forms, admirable and pleasing to the sensory perception. Under such definitions, it's obvious that the classical school would come into conflict with the modern school, which holds a somewhat contrary feeling on this matter. But as long as art originated and developed for centuries within the structure of philosophy, I think we must recognize that it belongs to a descent of philosophic insight. And that part of art which is contrary to philosophy must finally be considered contrary to aesthetics. Just as surely is that part of philosophy which in one way or another separates itself from the parent structure and attempts an isolated existence must inevitably be inferior to that total body from which it has separated itself. To the classical thinker, the search for the true nature of the beautiful was not without full recognition the difficulty with the definition of ultimate beauty, ultimate nobility, or ultimate perfection. For beauty is a kind of perfection. The classical writers, however, were of the opinion that nature again points the way. That in nature, 
all forms are essentially beautiful. And the various so-called accidents of nature by means of which things seem to be injured or broken, these accidents in the course of time are absorbed by nature itself into a noble compound of which no part is deficient in some kind of appreciable value. Actually, in nature, there is normal thing. And that uh, which is normal in its fullest terms in philosophy is in order. Its parts are functioning properly. Normalcy, therefore, means agreement with some recognized norm, in this case, the norm of nature itself. So that which is in its nature natural is not in any way distorted by artificial circumstances, but which continues to manifest through its construction, through its parts, through its organization, through its function the inevitable laws of nature, without deforming or defaming these laws. And such a structure must be harmonious, must be orderly and in itself beautiful. Beauty is therefore order, the proper relationship of parts. And to the ancients, it was a thing of itself although it might not have an existence apart from other things. Beauty, therefore, was present in all compounds, and it was the duty and responsibility of man to discover this beauty, serve it, release it from any bondage in which it might be involved, and give it the full recognition which it deserves. So in our study of aesthetics, uh, we are concerned not only with the beauties of form, but with the, with the beauties of character, the beauties of conduct, the beauties of nobility of purpose, the beauties of patience and honor, for that which in one way or another adorns virtue must be regarded as contributing beauty. Virtue in itself, perhaps, requires no definite or direct adornment. And yet, by its own nature, by the harmony of itself, it is adorned. So wherever things are right, there is a mysterious atmosphere of rightness about them. And this rightness we recognize as beauty. Now, there are certainly two or more standards of beauty with which we have to struggle consistently. The Greeks were of this opinion also. There is an archetypal beauty, a beauty which is in substance eternal, inevitable, absolute. This archetypal beauty is the end of all of the questing for what constitutes the beautiful. This archetypal beauty exists forever in the divine mind, in the divine consciousness, and it manifests eternally through the works of the divine, as these are brought to our attention in the various departments of creation. There is also a relative beauty, a beauty which is appreciable by those who have attained various levels or degrees. This relative beauty is a stage or condition of approach to absolute beauty. Relative beauty, therefore, is that part of the eternal or the inevitable which is appreciable by us, which we can understand, which we can sense or know. 
And it is in the field of relative beauty that we explain the infinite diversity of artistic representation that exists in the world. We know that primitive man had standards of beauty which we regard as in some ways inferior to our own. We also know that the primitive possessed a vitality, an integrity of power, which is often lacking in the decadent art of more sophisticated people. Last Sunday I went down to the uh, Park Museum and Exposition Park to see the archaeological exhibit from Mexico. It's a magnificent collection of materials. But as we wander through the galleries, we cannot help but say to ourselves, this art has a certain time and date stamp upon it. It has a true greatness a greatness which cannot be denied. Yet if one of these works of art were to be copied today by a contemporary artist, it would not be great. Nor would it be great if a contemporary artist simply went back and revitalized the entire school of the Aztec, Maya, Toltec, Sarastan culture. This art belonged to a time and to a people. Uh, for that time and that people, it was the fullest expression of creative aesthetic. We sense beneath the surface of it a certain degree of this vast, universal, archetypal art consciousness which we have mentioned. But it had not reached a perfect flower. It was strong. It was an honest art. It was an art which, obviously, the people not only respected but enjoyed. To us it might seem barbaric, but to them it was undoubtedly noble, the highest and fullest expression of their own genius. Because it was honest, it will always be good. Because it was very honest in some of its manifestations, part of it will always be great. But we must recognize it as part of a great parade of changing styles, fashions, and trends and creativity. In the same exhibition, we can move from the period of the Aztec Maya art to a room devoted uh, to the Spanish period. Here we see about as bad a group of decadent productions as anyone would ever want to look at. Uh, productions which showed the tragic consequence of a clean, primitive people taking on the dying sophistication of a decadent master race. Here there was very little of real value. The primitive integrity was gone. A hollow copyism took its place, one in which the worst was perpetuated. Here there was everything but genius, everything but merit, everything but honesty. But because these were lacking, there was nothing. This represents very largely the story of human aesthetics. This struggle to preserve honesty, and at the same time with honesty to achieve true greatness, without which none of these values have enduring quality for us. I think, therefore, that in the search for beauty, we must follow the philosophic realization that beauty, like veneration, is always limited by the degree of insight possessed by the human being. We also see this when we look back upon the changing fashions of time and wonder how people a few years ago could be so far from the aesthetic standards which we recognize today. Thus art has an outward life. 
a life in which it helps to mold or model our behavior. Art, however, like all branches of philosophy and also the general field of religion, must be wonderfully honest, or it is nothing. This honesty, however, is not to be measured according to the standards set up in the Latin Quarter of Paris. Honesty is not realism as we know it today. For realism as we understand it in modern Impressionism and post-Impressionism is an assumption, a disillusion, an example of a prevailing neurotic tendency to man himself. Realism now assumes that whatever we commonly experience in the dying out of a culture, whatever represents the deformities of human nature and behavior, that these are the realities. That man is actually a being in inevitably and eternally sick. And to present him in an artistic treatment means that this sickness must dominate the composition. He must be shown in all of his immediate infirmities. He must be depicted as without those graces of consciousness and spirit uh, which perhaps constitute his true humanity. So the entire theory of realism is based on the concept that the worst is the truth. And that in order to be realistic, we must take the beauty out of things. As a result of this attitude, most modern art depicts the works of men rather than the works of nature. It's very difficult to take the beauty out of the subject. It is almost inconceivable that man can take the beauty out of a mighty mountain with a stream running at its base. But it is quite possible for man to take the beauty out of sidewalk cafes. It is possible to take the beauty out of shops and stores and factories. And it is very easy to take the beauty out of modern architecture because there was not much there in the first place. So the realist, selecting carefully those things in which human limitations are most obvious, tries to create upon this pattern a canon of an acceptable art. It is the art of the deformed and the trivial. It is the art of the meaningless. It is a vague, vagrant experimentation with so-called artistic elements, without any insight, without any penetration, without any nobility of purpose to give vitality or integrity to the people. For these reasons and others equally valid, modern art is not honest. It is not a legitimate descendant of the great classical school. This does not mean that art cannot grow. It has always grown. It does not mean that it cannot unfold and mature and ripen. It does not mean that there is no place in it for innovation or change, no freedom of expression. What it really means is that progress in art must result from greatness of soul. And that which has no greatness of soul cannot have the dreams or the experiences within self which alone can achieve essential progress in the study. Lacking this inner capacity, well, the artist, if we should call him so, falls back upon tricks of the trade, falls back upon deceit, falls back upon flamboyance for values which he cannot legitimately supply. Art moving in, as Plato points out, covers not only uh, the vast areas of natural representation, as in architecture, music, the laying out of gardens, the painting of pictures, even going so far as the writing of poems, the marvelous painting of word pictures, 
in the high language of romance literature. Plato points out that art, as is its final purpose, it, its adornment of the human being himself. Beauty becomes, as Pythagoras said, the medicine of the soul. The soul, in order to interpret beauty, to express beauty from within itself, must, to a certain measure, achieve normal, achieve the rightness of its own experience. The soul has to know beauty. It has to experience the need for beauty. It has to experience the discovery of the beautiful. Thus it was, and it was assumed, that perhaps the soul, or psychic part of man, was that most closely associated with beauty, and that beauty belonged to the great descent of emotional values, rather than those essentially intellectual. Yet beauty can be rationalized, it is reasonable. Yet if we go too far in the interpretation of it from a mental point of view, we are apt to destroy its sensitivity or shatter some strange mystical vibratory pattern which is associated with the great symmetry of creative art. So in the st uh, study of beauty, what man is really searching for is something that pleases him. If art is to be truly meaningful to the individual, it must bring with it an instinctive satisfaction. It must cause the person to appreciate that which is worthy of appreciation. Within his own nature, worthiness finds its valuation. So the individual will, unless variously uh, it is aesthetic sense. He will inevitably value that which is valuable. He will find the instinct to select that which is the best which he can appreciate. Thus the individual enjoys art. He likes to live with it. He likes to be surrounded by things of beauty and of charm and of graciousness. He likes to find in art also a certain measure of instruction. And this is one of the very sensitive points in modern art. The concept today is that art must have no instructional value. Of course, there is one modern school, well to the left of center, that insists that all art must have social significance. It must be propaganda. And propaganda in this case is nearly always a, a frontal attack upon privileged classes or groups. Uh, the uh, propaganda, therefore, of the modern left bank artist is distinctly a socialistic or communistic propaganda. In order to achieve, however, propaganda, the person must thrust his own interpretations upon nature. He must use art as a means of selling or overselling an idea of his own, which may or may not have any solid substance in the great realities of life. Thus, art with social significance is really a highly conditioned form of advertising. It is a, an art of public relations. It is an art of selling the ideas, attitudes, or convictions of the artist to the beholder. Now, but for the most part, while we don't realize this, we allow to come into our homes today works of art which we give honored places. Yet the artist who painted these things would not be an acceptable guest. We would not 
with joy is complete. We would find that he is a bore, uh, that he is a dissipated and profane person with very few ideals and practically no gentility. We would not want to associate with him, but we will pay a fortune for his production, simply because they have been highly commercially exploited. To the, uh, to the Greek, this type of the use of art is a blasphemy, a profaning of a great and noble value. We do not use great things to achieve small ends. We do not bind noble institutions to the fulfillment of the passing whims of generations. And in art, we have no right to use it primarily as a means of exploiting ideas. So the classics, classical masters and the philosophers of art tell us frankly that all art has to have meaning that an art that is absolutely meaningless is sterile, that an art that conveys nothing cannot convey even itself. We look at a picture, if it means absolutely nothing, we turn from it. We're not interested in it. If it awakens no values within ourselves, if it inspires no nostalgic reminiscences, if it suggests no escapes from the monotony of our daily existence, if it seems to possess no virtues and no values, we simply walk away untouched by it. Therefore, while an art should not oversell, it certainly cannot be without some form of reason for its own existence. An art which exists only to support the artist is of no value to anyone. Consequently, we must recognize that great art, which has survived, has survived because of some intangible importance in its very structure and nature. Until the dawn of what we call modern times, nearly all great art was religious. It might not be obviously but for the most part, art was used as a means of revealing ideals. It was not preaching entirely, rather it was teaching. It did not need to preach because the common message which it conveyed was known already to all concerned. But it made a gracious new presentation of this traditionally acceptable message. Consequently, we will find in Europe thousands of Madonnas by great artists, literally thousands of holy families, and probably almost as many crucifixions and resurrections, to say nothing of an endless pageantry of saints, martyrs, angels, and related themes. Uh, these art productions belong to their time. Many of them would be regarded today as over sentimental. But they had one value about them, and that is that with a few, a very few exceptions, uh, they would not hurt anyone. Uh, you might feel just a little embarrassed the presence of so much piety, but there was nothing ugly about them, or at least not intentionally. Some religious themes were a little gruesome, and the martyrdom of saints was not an entirely popular subject. But at the same time, it represented an integrity. The saint was dying for his conviction. Therefore, beneath it all, the purpose was to convey value. This value uh, made the art meaningful to its time and helped it to contribute something to the gradual spread of Christian morality. With the rise of modernism in the West, uh, the uh, general trend was secular in art. 
It became less and less a means of telling anything. Until finally it became a psychological art, an art which conveyed only one message, and that is the psychic content of the artist whether he was a sick man or a well man, whether he was a happy man or an unhappy man, whether he was dissipated and corrupted, or whether he was a person of high sentiments and values. The art became very largely psychological portraiture, and it remains that mostly to this time. The uh, problem then comes back again as to what kind of art is useful. And the Greek would tell us rather simply, and most of the early classic uh, artists and most of the great Oriental masters, uh, that art is a form of ministry. It is a form of providing the individual with a new dimension of insight into value. And with all this value, not the intellectual training of the mind, but the creation of an inward joy, an inward reverence, an inward understanding or insight by which the individual was glad that this art had, made, had been made available to him, the experience added to the richness of his life. This was very largely the case in most of the great arts of Asia, and uh, particularly perhaps in the Zen art of China and Japan. Here we are reminded again and again of the, sim of the sublimity of the simple, the magnificence of the commonplace, the essential value of simple, humble things. And yet all of this art is permeated with a vast pageantry of honor and honesty. It is an art rich in reminding the individual of the wonderful world that he lives in and all that is here that is glorious and meaningful to him. The struggle between the painter's brush and the camera uh, began to be felt in the second half of the 19th century. A great deal of art disappeared and a great many artists turned to other trades and professions because they believed that it was impossible for the artist to compete with the lens of the camera. This was again because the artists of that time had already passed into such a photographic type of depiction that they had destroyed most of their own value. Art is not photographic reproduction of subject matter. The camera can never be equaled or, in, or excelled if you wish to produce a documentary. But a documentary conveys very little more to the beholder than he sees himself as he stands and looks out against the mountain or toward the sea. The great purpose of art is to, in one way or another, release the beauty in things through the discrimination, discriminating censorship of the material involved in a picture. No great artist painting a scene ever paints it exactly as he sees it. He paints it with a certain discrimination added from his own insight. His purpose is always to remove from the scene the non-essentials which have a tendency to crowd it or to cause it to lose its essential framework. Thus an artist painting trees against the sky will not paint them as the camera lens will represent them. He will remove certain trees that are not necessary to his picture. He will just leave them out or he will move the mountain a little way to the right or left. He will change things in order to bring the picture into its meaning rather than into its immediate form. Thus, as the Hermetic axiom says, art perfects nature. 
Art perfects it by revealing it, by releasing it, by freeing it from its own confusion. And here we have a very important point. Man is surrounded by so much that he can appreciate very little of it. Art helps to center his attention. Art captures some salient feature, quietly eliminates the rest, so that the person looking at the picture feels he has seen it all. But a large part of this seeing has been within his own country. He may therefore gain a great insight and a great pleasure from the picture, which he could never gain, gain from a faithful photograph of the same subject. The color it is the same. No man can imitate nature completely. No camera film can reproduce natural color perfectly. So the artist creates a color palette of his own, in which he very marvelously interprets and colorates his own insight. If his insight is real, if his love and respect for nature are honorable, if he possesses something within himself of the gentle, kindly, philosophic teacher, the picture will convey the lesson which he intends that it should present. But lacking these characteristics in himself, he can see no more in the object which he paints than he can bestow upon it out of his own insight. Art must therefore have meaning. But it must have studied meaning. It must have meaning that is based upon a hold of value. Artists in themselves must represent a standard of life, a standard of value. Now, they must in some way be superior persons in their power to penetrate into the substances and essences of living experience. If the artist is merely uh, one working with technique alone who will produce soulless products, which will mean very little to himself and will have very slight surviving power. In the search for the beautiful, man also has to realize that his ability to create beauty and his ability to recognize beauty both of these powers reside in some psychic dimension of his own inner life. Plotinus, in his great essay on the beautiful, uh, tells us very clearly that beauty is a mood, a force, a power, which arising within the individual ennobles him rededicates him to all things that are fine and true in life. The beauty is an ecstasy of the soul. It is the soul rushing forth joyously to embrace its own likeness in other things. It is truth within man finding truth in every other thing. And it is finally the truth in every other thing discovered once more within man. Therefore, it is part of this mysterious bond that ties heaven and earth together. It is like the rainbow, which is the promise of the forgiveness of God in all things. Beauty is more than merely an aesthetic thing. It is a tremendous spiritual proof of the presence of universal law and eternal principle. For all these principles in themselves are beautiful, orderly, inevitable. Everywhere in nature, law imposes itself upon structure in a lawful way. And this lawfulness we turn beauty, even as we experience it the multiform, crystal-like structures of snowflakes. Everywhere we perceive that God works with beauty to produce good. To the degree that man becomes an artist, he therefore, to a measure, plays God. He takes upon himself certain of the creative attributes of God. 
discovering these attributes by exploring his own inner consciousness where he finds forever the presence of God. So the artist is a creator. He is in, in creator by a mysterious power of interpretation. He is not creating something from nothing, but he is taking all the things that are and rearranging them in new patterns so that art is a new presentation of that which is itself eternal. Art is also a sort of eagerness to discover the beauty in things in which this beauty may seem to be concealed. Art is a sort of game, an eternal effort to discover value, to solve the riddle which nature confronts us with the riddle of finding the good in things which seem to be bad, the finding the eternal in things that seem to be born and die, to find the unchanging nature of the infinite in things which appear to be in continuous and perpetual change. All of these factors together mean that art is involved in a kind of mystical experience. And just as surely as illumination comes to the sage, so the form and nature of this illumination is very often a beautiful experience, an experience of light and color and melody and sound and harmony. The universe suddenly unfolds as a structure of eternal, imperishable beauty, so sublime that the human being is almost unable to bear the vision of its presence. Before this beauty man falls, he sinks into the sense of his own insignificance. This beauty overwhelms him, producing a strange ecstasy in his own nature, so that everywhere the search for truth is an experience of beauty of some kind. Beauty of thought, beauty of word, beauty of conduct. And everything that is worthy of emulation is worthy because it has a nature in which a man can reasonably and graciously copy or admire. So the ancients were very clear in their sense of the religious meaning of beauty. They warned against the perversion of its principles. They warned against the corruption of its very structure or the prostitution of its principles. They also pointed out that experience, long even in olden times, indicated that as beauty fails, so peoples fail. The loss of beauty heralded the end of civilization. But men could no longer discern that which was truly noble, when they would no longer sacrifice the lesser parts of themselves to the preservation of greater good. These men were then no longer suited to preserve cultures or civilization or to extend their dominions and domains. That uh, people which lost beauty within itself was already dying, and in a few years its physical, visible structure would also be destroyed. Moral beauty, as we are told, it has to do with the nature of conduct, and in this we also have some recommendations and suggestions out of the past. When we listen to our own voices, and we suddenly find these voices raised in anger, or in condemnation, or in great impatience. We sense immediately that the beauty has gone out of that voice. We can imagine a chorus uniting its voices in a magic anthem, in a tremendous statement of musical sublimity. And we can imagine the howling, shouting cries of a mob. Perhaps a mob 
uh, such as came finally to dominate France during the revolution. We hear in one the noble strains of an exalted spirit, and in the other bitterness, sharpness, hatred. We see in the second the horror of a world that has lost control of itself. We have this same experience in our own daily living. We look into a mirror. We see our faces distorted by hate, anger, grievances of one kind or another. We see the motions of our bodies made brittle and unpleasing due to the stress and strain of nervous tension. Uh, we observe how worry lines the face and takes the graciousness from it. How long-held attitudes of spite and grievance drop the corners of the mouth and form sad, hard lines upon the feet. We see how the lack of beauty in ourselves finally communicates itself to the body. But what we do not fully understand is that this loss of beauty is also communicating itself to the mind, uh, to the vitality, to the structure of our fabric, and is opening us to disease and sickness and misery, and is gradually taking away from us all of these better values which we should be cultivating. So that sometimes we see in the kindly face of age the beautiful expression of a patient and enlightened soul. We sense the deep nobility of the face of Plato, and how also wisdom shone through the less attractive features of Socrates, a man not handsome in his body, but in whose eyes and in his face with a great light of insight, a great wonder of understanding, so that when a disciple was once asked how he could endure the ungainly appearance of the teacher, the disciple replied quite simply and honestly, I have never noticed that he was not handsome. The inner life of things, shining through not only reveals the beauty of the soul, but smooths the way of life in many, many regards and respects. It helps us to have a richer life, a happier life, a kinder life. And anything which causes a symmetry to arise within ourselves is not good. Any emotion or attitude that is not beautiful is harmful. And no amount of explanation no justification can be advanced any more than we can justify an, an example of bad art simply because of the time in which it was produced or the circumstances through which the artist may have passed. Bad art is bad art regardless of how, when, or where it was created. And a bad disposition is a tragedy no matter how much the individual can apparently justify his attitude. So as we seek to make the world more beautiful through art, we also attempt to work the transformations of art upon our own character, thus leading us uh, to a more advanced and enlightened relationship with the world in which we exist. And this brings us naturally to perhaps the crowning level of philosophy. That phase or branch which is sometimes not included within the six branches of the philosophic system, but which was essentially added by the Neoplatonists of Alexander, who realized that the great structure of philosophy not only arose from one essential principle, but in the end must be gathered again into one essential substance. So they created the seventh branch of philosophy, which they call theurgy. And perhaps we can best describe theurgy as a divine kind of magic. 
It is the magic of the working of God in man. It is the magic and mystery of enlightenment. It is the alchemy of, trans of transmutation which is accomplished uh, as the result of what Pythagoras calls the philosophic life. So theurgy is that branch of philosophy which has been most completely neglected for nearly 2,000 years. For today we seldom if ever hear any reference to the philosophic life. We know that there are many scholars and many great individuals. And we study the biographies of great philosophers and scholars, and we are told that one was a dyspeptic, another was unable to gather his resources together to maintain his own family, or third, had the most extraordinary and delinquent personal habits, and another was a political fanatic. These studies that they had made, by which they gained a great distinction for the reasonable and logical unfoldment of ideas, seemingly never touched their lives. They became learned, but not wise. They became brilliant, but not good. They became skillful but not happy. In some way, the wisdom which they accumulated was put away in some closet or in some department of life or hoarded in some vault where it might be protected against loss or decay, but it was never used. It was never the basis of a daily conduct. And when we think of philosophy as it is taught in modern universities, uh, we know that some of these schools have exceptionally fine schools of philosophy. Although I think it is generally agreed that at this time the greater weight uh, in philosophic studies uh, goes toward psychology, uh, where many young people feel a brilliant profession awaits them. But in the philosophical department, you seldom if ever hear of the application of any system of philosophy to any person actually in trouble. They never get around to this. The student himself is not told to use his philosophy in the solution of his own problem. He is told to remember the words of the wise to compare them, uh, to arrange them, and if possible, to take a highly critical situation in which he seeks in every way possible to find defects in the thinking of other people. Overall is the general concept that philosophy is, after all, a kind of pedant. A sort of a mental luxury for those who may sometimes sometime become professors or who would like perhaps to have the ornamentation of it in genteel letters. But philosophy is no longer regarded as a living force even where it is taught. And if you should point out to a, a group of students of philosophy, perhaps working for their masters or their doctorates, that the beginning and end of philosophy is to roll up your sleeves and use it, they would consider you mad. It just has no part in the teaching of things today. But the Greeks, particularly of Alexandria, during the first three centuries of the Christian era, were convinced that all philosophy was perfected by the philosophic life, the life of wisdom. That no matter how brilliant you became or how much you were able to remember or how conversant you became with system, you had only a brittle, superficial grasp of it, unless in some way you could transmute knowledge into insight and understanding within your own experience, within your own consciousness. Therefore, as Plotinus said to one of his young disciples, make philosophy your journey. 
use the philosophic system as a guide to conduct, as something to be continuously applied to the problem of your own day. It would seem very strange that an individual would spend many years studying Aristotle or Plato, and then in any difficulty that arose had to go to someone else for help. It simply meant that this person had never really thought of philosophy as a living instrument. He thought of it only as a cultural embellishment. He thought of it as something that it was nice to know, like a good suit of clothes. It was a status symbol. If you could toss the right words around, uh, it seemed uh, rather important. But to use these guys, uh, represented a new dimension of approach to wisdom. And this was what the Greek uh, uh, Alexandrian Neoplatonists referred to as theurgy. It was the transmuting magical power of wisdom operating in the daily life of the person. It meant that as wisdom increased, the individual increased. It meant that with every new discovery, there was new richness of character, of nobility, of action. And of course, all of the theological art uh, had to do with man's victory over doubt. Doubt, in some way, were the weaknesses of men. Man, forever uncertain of his own behavior and less certain of the behavior of others, lived in a world of doubting, a world in which he had inadequate faith built upon inadequate knowledge. It was the duty, therefore, of theurgy, so to say, as a part of philosophy, to dispel man's most common and frequent doubt, particularly his doubts concerning providence, concerning God, concerning the nature of good and evil, and the eternality of the world. If man was able to clarify within himself his doubts about justice, if he could really believe to the very core of his nature that he did live in a universe that was essentially just, if he could rationally demonstrate this to himself, if he could logically prove it, if he could aesthetically justify it, if he could metaphysically experience it, if he could find in it all of the reason that, that was necessary to convince himself, if he could justify in his own thinking the full scope of epistemology and psychology in these respects, then, in a strange way, he came to the end of his, of his uncertainty his disturbances. He came finally to those certitudes which permit him to relax, uh, to no longer struggle against unrighteous fortune, no longer to take the natural, maturing power of reason. So we have the completely reasonable person, the classic archetypal fraternal image of the wise man. We have this wise man as the kindly grandfather, the man who belongs to the long livers who has lived long and well, who has passed through all the moods and intranquillities of existence and come finally to a gentle and safe harbor where he is at rest with life and with people and with things, with himself and with God. 
this type of peace arising from the full use of faculty rather than the denial of them. This peace, which is knowledge carried on until it becomes a living value in our daily experience. Now this, uh, in a way, sets the situation for the theurgical peace. For just as surely as in the Eastern religion, it was necessary to renounce the unreal in order to attain reality. So in the Greek and classical system, man had to penetrate the unreal by the instruments of philosophy to discover the true world that lay behind the appearances of things. And most of all, to discover this true world to be a natural marvel of beauty and truth. And in this discovery, gaining a complete confidence with the wisdom and benevolence of eternal providence. Having attained such levels, as Plotinus points out, the wise man ceases all unreasonable attitudes. He knows too well the structure of human beings to criticize or condemn. He knows too well the workings of human nature to be confused or deceived by it. He accepts things as they are. He realizes the inevitability of existing conditions. He moves through existing uh, relationship with a full understanding of their bearing upon eternal facts. And he c expects this world to be a place of instruction, not a place of gratification. And he thus renounced false values by the aid of philosophic discipline. He is able to reach out to embrace true values. And in this uh, degree, he begins his experience of the philosophic life. He becomes the person who is un unmoved by the non-tranquillities of passing occasions and conditions. And dwelling as he does always in a deep internal relaxation, he has at all times the full availability of his faculty. Having no false opinions, he will not deceive himself. Having no unreasonable ambitions, he will not be deceived by others. Expecting no more than is due, he will have no false hopes. Perfectly willing to accept that which is his proper responsibility, he will have no false fears. And as the Bhagavad Gita says in India, unmoved in pain and pleasure, this one is fitted for immortality. Philosophy then, by tempering away all of the intemperances of existence, brings the person finally uh, to a happy, amicable relationship with truth, fact, and reality. It is obvious, of course, that all philosophic systems do not inevitably confer such blessings. For these systems may be in conflict with each other. The teachings which they disseminate may be contradictory. Most philosophic systems, especially those of the modern world, were not founded upon a solid insight but rather upon a scientific analysis of previous opinion. Uh, the philosophy was simply another kind of science, groping from one kind of intellectual fact to another. The great philosopher was the brilliant thinker who could unseat some previous opinion and put his own in its place. There was no problem of true greatness of character. As a result, we have had a great many schools of thought, 
some very brilliant, some very difficult to refute, some pathetic in their inability to confer the slightest consolation upon the human heart, some utterly uh, devoid of idealism, some captured in the most abject melancholy, some fearing the worst, some hoping the worst, but very few with any substance by which man could solve the immediate needs of his day. As a result of this sterility in modern philosophy, it has made practically no contribution to the advancement of society or the preservation of human values. It has, if anything, joined with other bitter and limited perspectives to undermine what ideals and principles the human race had been able to preserve. It is, as of, it is true of this as of aesthetics, that that philosophy which does no good must almost certainly do harm. That which gives man no greater nobility takes something away from that which he already has. And to train the young in ideas and attitudes made illustrious by great names, but calculated to destroy the inner value of these young people, to take from them faith in humanity, faith in nature, faith in God, faith in truth, to thus deprive the student of these needed elements of his own maturity is to deform him rather than to advance his culture. There is no great beauty in dissolution, nor is there any use in taking the attitude that we might know as well know the worst now as later. If we were not so anxious to know the worst now, we might be able to build a much stronger foundation so that in the future things would be better and not worse. The urgy is the transforming power of enlightened wisdom. It is the rich, warm quality of friendliness. The word philosophy means friendliness or truth. The philosopher is the friend of truth. He wishes to be a good friend. He wishes to have the deep fraternal relationship with those principles which are enduring. Friends are kindly people, interested more in the good of their friend than in the good of themselves. And in philosophy, the true philosopher is interested in the spreading and sharing of philosophic insight, rather than merely the winning of an argument or the establishment of himself as an authority on some particular school or some previous intellectual. In the Eastern world, we have some interesting thoughts about this. The responsibility of philosophy is always the responsibility of the teacher. The teacher-student relationship is almost inevitable. In the East, the student-teacher relationship is finally summarized in the concept of the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is the exalted soul in Buddhism that has renounced uh, the attainment of the Saranivana to return and instruct those who have not yet been emancipated from illusion. So the Bodhisattva becomes the teacher, the savior, the liberator, the enlightener. In all Buddhist literature, this point is clearly brought out that even the Bodhisattva has to be extremely careful, lest his effort to serve others so will swing back upon himself and cause him to strengthen the illusion of his own importance. 
You see, if any individual believes that he becomes the instructor of others, he must also, to a measure, believe that he is valuable. And it is but a very little way between this recognition of self-value and a hopeless spiritual arrogance. And individuals who claim to be devoting their lives to the service of other people are actually profoundly enjoying the fact that they are able to influence other lives. Philosophy is not sound. Therefore, in philosophy, it is very important always to realize that we are the servants of something greater than ourselves, that our own satisfaction is not important. But the real important thing is that we are able in one way or another to share or communicate a condition of natural existence which may be properly termed the philosophic life. If through our own conduct we are able to demonstrate that we have complete victory over the intemperances of our own nature, then in this way we become solid instructors of others. If, however, ignoring the innumerable imperfections of our own characters, we hasten out to save others, it may be a suspected that our motives are not entirely adequate. So in philosophy, the philosophic life has to be lived from the beginning to the end. Each step has to be taken with the patience, forbearance, and insight of the truly wise. And in the uh, Neoplatonic system, following very largely the Platonic disciplines and the Pythagorean disciplines, a way was set out by means of which the philosopher uh, could gradually uh, recognize the development of his own character. Philosophy began with a decision, a decision which only time could mature, a decision that was essentially a dedication. And whether the individual uh, really recognized the value of his own decision at the time he made it, it's hard to say. But he lived in an age, at a time, when this decision was of value, but it was the decision of the noblest of his own people, and it was the decision of those whom he most respected and most admired. He had to formally and without equivocation or reservation within himself dedicate his own nature to the philosophic life. He had to assume within himself that from that time on his life belonged to truth rather than to his own nature. Uh, that his entire career must have as its primary objective the purification of his own nature. This did not mean that he had to reject all relationships with the common problems of living. But it did mean that he could no longer drift away or wander away into the bypath which led to the forgetfulness of his primary purpose. From the time of this basic obligation, he changed the general perspective of his life. He realized that he lived in order to grow, that growth unfold revelation of the divine purpose through his own nature. This large concept must guide him and regulate his conduct. He lived truly, perhaps, in the biblical thought, not my will, but thine be done. He lived no longer just to do as he pleased but to do that which was necessary in order that the divine plan should be advanced by his efforts. He became a truth seeker. He became a truth server. And only by these dedications could he ever ultimately attain 
the goal which all men are seeking. He already assumed truth to be the most precious thing in the world, more valuable than any opinion, more important than any feud which he might like to carry on, superior to any intemperance or intolerance of attitude which was peculiar to his own nature, infinitely superior to wealth, power, or the satisfaction of any worldly uh, cause. That his alle allegiance to truth came before his allegiance to anything else that existed. But fortunately, his allegiance to truth did not in any way interfere with his allegiance to any other just thing. It really meant that he no longer bestowed any of his energy or any of his life upon inferior causes or destructive situations. He learned that the only way in which he could live for truth alone was to become indifferent as to his own life, indifferent as to whether he lived or died, concerning on, concern only with the basic problem of living well and dying well. It was no longer important to him whether he was recognized by others, applauded or rewarded in any way. He was seeking that which is the ultimate reward. He was seeking the greatest treasure in the world. Therefore, he must give to this quest all the greatness of himself. By degrees, he recognized and integrated his life around a very important force. But it was without any of the sense of spiritual ambition, which we also have to guard against. There are many people who have selfishly departed from all the responsibilities of life simply to find their own way to some paradisical sphere to come, with no thought for anything except their own happiness and their own convenience. This is not the point at all. If it is attempted in this way, failure is inevitable. What the wise person is attempting to do is to gain a complete relaxation within the very essence or substance of the divine purpose itself to become completely dedicated and at the same time strangely purposeless, to have a goal that is inevitable and yet never to fight or struggle for that goal, realizing always that the great attainment is by a complete release of the individual from his own purposes or his own ambitions. Always the distinct and de a definite determination to remain accepted, to take into himself that which was for him, to fulfill that which was required of him, to fail in nothing, but to have no purpose apart from the divine purpose, so that truly he was God's man, that he served as a proper liege man to that which was eternal truth itself. But this type of dedication, uh, we find the gradual relaxing of the intellect away from most of the complexities with which we associate even philosophy. There is a philosophy which transcends itself. There is a philosophy that is so indescribably simple that words cannot be found that are small enough to define it. There is a philosophy so immediate that it is captured in an instant. There is a wisdom that breaks away entirely from the infinite formalities of definition and description that has never been held or captured within a syllogism, which has never at any time been subjected uh, to a classification into categories. There is simply this each 
eternal, absolute reasonableness of things, which is so mysterious that it is experienced before it is understood, that it is known before it can be defined. And having understood it and defined it, there is no longer any need to, de to describe it or to contemplate or to justify the processes which it indicates. For all philosophy ends in certain. And certain these are things which arise in the experience of consciousness which cannot be refuted. When man is faced with a certainty, there is a voice within him that says, This is certain. This cannot be changed. This is inevitable, immutable, immovable. These certainties come gradually to the individual. But they certainly arise when he transcends the common processes of the mind. The new Platonists were perfectly in harmony with Buddha in realizing that the mind is a wonderful servant, but a heartless taskmaster. That in some mysterious way it was the duty of the mind finally to transcend itself. It was the duty of the mind to give way to a faculty superior to reason. The mind provided a ladder, the so-called escalade de la sage, the ladder of the Satan. Up this ladder, which was also Bacon's mysterious pyramid of past, up this ladder the mind descends, rung by rung, step by step until it reaches the highest part of the ladder. And here definitions fail. Here all things which arise in the mind become inadequate. Here all systems as we know them are transcended and appear somewhat ridiculous. Here man suddenly discovers the meaninglessness of his own speculation and wondered, wonders how he might, in his inf in infantile mind, have been so plagued with the doubts and policies which seem so important to him in his daily life. There comes, of course, this point, therefore, in which the mind comes to the extremity of itself, but it can no longer cope with the mystery of reality. Our way of thinking always is the same. It is quantitative, not qualitative. Our idea of reality as we send our astronauts out into space is the gradual conquest of an infinite number of stars. Our idea of, our, of going out, going forth, going toward the infinite is to approach an infinite diversity a transcendent, incalculable infinitude of forms and beings and powers and energies and qualities. Every discovery that we make seems to indicate that there is more that we must know than we have ever suspected, and that therefore we must continually meet this challenge by the infinite development of faculties and propensities and powers mechanisms, methods, and means. In other words, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So according to the uh, classic thinking, this vast increase in the phenomenal aspect of things uh, is an illusion. There is not a constant increase of knowledge. There is not a universe that is growing bigger every moment. The fact of the matter really is that man, in his effort to grasp the universe, in his effort to understand, in his effort to arrive at a conscious relationship with life, must continually simplify. He must find that when he understands one principle, he destroys ten million complexities. 
But when he discovers one law, he wipes out a cosmos of apparent accidents, circumstances, and mysteries that appear incomprehensible to him. As he goes further and further in his qualitative search for reality, reality becomes more and more simple. Its manifestations may be infinite, but its substance is extremely simple. We have the same mysterious experience with life itself. Man is a creature of many and complex attributes and qualities. Yet within each of us is something that makes us alive here and now, and that is a little spark. We actually know nothing about this spot. We know that it can stand tremendous stress, that it may survive accidents and conditions which appear uh, to be beyond the power of man to survive. And yet we know that this little spark may go out in sleep for no reason that we have any understanding of that it can be blown out like the flame of a candle in an instant, or it may struggle against the limitations of the flesh for eighty years. We know not what this thing is, but it is life, and it is one thing, and it is utter simplicity because it is utter life, and yet it sustains upon itself and by itself and within itself all the functions of the human body. Somewhere in space is reality, an absolutely simple flame, a tremendous thing that can be experienced, perhaps most perfectly by a child, most perfectly by someone who has never been deluded or confused by the extravagances of learning. The men going out to conquer time and space are always conquered by it and leave their own bones somewhere on the shores of the infinite ocean. The conquest of the unknown is this strange, mysterious, simple inner experience by which alone man can arrive at certainty, an experience of a moment, a mystical insight, an instance of silence in space, a moment of absolute rapport between the being and the infinite, and the discovery that this rapport is not man as a humble creature bowing before a vast magnificence, but a strange reaching out of life to life with an absolute intimacy, with a fraternity, with the simplest relationship of parent to child, or the deep and wonderful value of two lovers. It is not this strange, formidable thing we are forever fighting. So philosophy through theurgy tries to give us this experience, this, this wisdom that is beyond wisdom. It tells us some way that we must finally outgrow our own intelligence outgrow our own mind. We must go through the process of the mind until it discovers for itself its own futility. For until then, it can never get over its own insufferable arrogance. But there comes a time when it becomes exhausted of its own ineffectiveness. All its speculations, all its strategies, all its conspiracies come to nothing. All its false knowledge and vain glory fails. And the individual who has mastered all the arts and sciences of the world feels in helpless tears beside the crib of his own dying child, unable to do anything whatever. Life, therefore, has to have another answer to all this. It has to have the tremendous answer of the immediacy of the availability of pure life of pure reality, of pure truth, of pure insight. This is the urge. This is this wonderful thing by which man penetrates not only the pretensions of others, but most of all his own pretensions. 
suddenly discovering the true dimensions of his own wisdom and ignorance, and perceiving his true place in an eternal pattern of things. We have every reason to believe that in the advancing years of his life, Plato achieved this theurgic consciousness. We learn that as he grew older, his mind began to take less interest in the great profundities of thought, which had once distinguished him. He was still the great philosopher, but through his greatness was coming a strange childlikeness. It was this gradual liberation from all desire for disputation and profound argument and for deep analysis and for vast interpretation that finally separated Aristotle from Plato. Aristotle wanted to go on systematizing knowledge. He wanted to know more and more. And Plato was gradually discovering that knowledge was a burden upon the spirit. And Plato drifted more and more into the mystic. I suppose some of his more analytical disciples were convinced that the great philosopher was entering his second childhood, that perhaps his mind was weakening with the years. But Plato did not have the kind of mind that weakened. He grew strangely strong. Plato reached the point where he no longer needed philosophy, as we think. What need has a man of philosophy who has lived it all his life? What needs the individual of reason, who is by nature reasonable? How much can we require ethics if we are ethical by soul? If we are, if we are honorable in the spirit of our very transaction, why do we have to study ethics? If everything that we think is filled with nobility and beauty, and we have, ma have, have cultivated the virtue as the simple adorations of principle. What need have we of ethics? What need have we of aesthetics? We are all these things already in ourselves. When by our own insight we have evaluated the mind in all its functions, when we know the true nature of our own thought, and can intuitively interpret the thoughts of others. What need have we of psychology? We cannot be neurotic. We cannot have these problems in ourselves, because into our own consciousness we have through the years built the perfect substance of our own belief. And we have linked our belief so closely to our consciousness that there is no conflict in the subconscious nature of ourselves. What need has such a person of philosophy? He cannot attain it because he already is it. He is an embodiment of it. He does not have to go to school to study that which is his own very nature and substance. But having attained all of this, having come to the strange and wonderful tranquility the prophetic genius of the Platonic mind. Plato began to demonstrate something else. There began to appear in his nature what some of his disciples, particularly his nephew, Eusippus, called the loneliness of an old man. Plato was lonely. He had all this knowledge, but somehow his eyes drifted to the sunset. There was nothing more that he needed to know. There was nothing more that wisdom could teach him. Perhaps he was too tired to learn arts and sciences, which were as yet but partially structured in his own day. But everything that was essential to him, he already possessed. Yet he he lacked something. He lacked freedom. Freedom from his own existence. 
She lacked that complete freedom of the bird that flies out into the sky. Plato wanted to go home. Plato wanted to be one with this universe, which he already understood. He wanted to be free of these strange fetters and limitations which were the final dividers between the finite and the infinite. He wanted to, to mingle the common essence of his own soul with the eternal soul in space. He had loved God. He had loved truth. He had served both God and truth for the whole heart. Now he wanted to go home to God and truth. He wanted to be one with that which he had loved so long. There was no other need of wisdom. There was no other goal, no other purpose that was desirable. By his very nature, he went to sleep one night with the poems of Sophron for a pillow under his head. He did not wake again. He died as he had lived in complete peace. So this peculiar and wonderful concept of the wise person quietly going home, without doubt, without fear, without any uncertainty, with no expectation of heavenly rest, no probability of infernal unrest, only the soul going home to the universe of realities, of beauties, of, re of divinities, which it had rationally experienced. But it is one thing to speak of these things, to bring, to bring them up in the mind, to find the experience of intellect about them. It is one thing to know that God is there, another thing to step across and be one with God. This was the, the goal. This was the mysterious end which the Alexandrian mystics Thought to communicate in the concept of the urge. The urge was the taking of all of this wonderful intellectual mystery, simplifying it to its ultimate, and discovering in this ultimate simplicity the union with truth which all the complexities of the mind could not attain. There are so many arts and so many sciences, and if things continue as they are now, the young people of the future are going to have a very bad time of it. It already takes over 20 years of life to complete an education. If the present form of knowledge continues to increase, enrich as it is now, adding specialized knowledge of any kind, within the next 50 years, the average young person may not be able to graduate into a technical education before he is 40 years old. This means his life is two-thirds finished before he has been able to accumulate either his own mind, the wisdom of his time, the skills, the scientific patterns, formulas, and precision which are necessary to the practice of an advanced art or science. As we go on, the time will continually increase. So man, perhaps, in the conquest of the theories of knowledge, will never live to practice. This is not nature's intent. This is not the end. Theurgy would tell us that probably in a few years, four or five years at most, it might be possible for man to attain the substance of that as we progress, our periods of schooling should be less, not greater, because our own insight should be growing, grasping more of eternity constantly and requiring less of instruction. The individual today should be born with a knowledge that the past never possessed. Perhaps he is born with that knowledge, but until he is searched, until we give attention to this and no longer assume that he is born in a state of virgin ignorance, 
and therefore must be indoctrinated from the cradle. Perhaps if we took a different approach, we would discover that maybe man does not know the prominent and dominating opinions of this generation. But deep within him is a knowledge of the eternal values of the infinite itself. That man who was born to outlive all generations must have a wisdom greater than generations. But this is possible, and this is true. The search for these verities were the very substances of the Neoplatonic philosophy. But sometimes man would be able to adjust his consciousness again with the infinite mind. And in that adjustment, discover all that was real and quietly reject all that is unreal. Recognizing that reality to be the possession of such knowledge as contributes to man's eternity, makes him greater than the ages, brings him inevitably to the full citizenship in eternity. All other knowledge is passing, but the knowledge which transcends knowledge, which may be termed the knowledge of knowledge, the wisdom of wisdom, is that which is discovered by penetrating all systems to find in their heart a living fact that this living fact cannot be analyzed, but it can be shared, it can be experienced, it can be conferred by intuition alone. It can be known because it is a fact. This knowledge can come instantly, whereas the knowledge of the consequences of this fact might require ages to accumulate. So theurgy is this instantaneous availability of the infinite, based, however, upon man's dedication to the qualification of his own nature for the experience of truth to occur within himself. This, then, represents the application of philosophy, the final fulfillment of it, where it verges to mingle its courses with religion where it becomes part of the great process of man's spiritual growth. Well, I think our time is up, folks, so I guess we'll have to call it evening. Now, I'd like to point out that this evening and next Wednesday evening, these being the last two evenings of our classes, our little gift shop will be open for those who might wish to look around. It will be, it will be open this evening and next Wednesday evening after the lecture as well as before. Also, the library is open with a new exhibit which we think you will find most interesting. And there are also some delightful art things there that you may enjoy seeing. We thank you and hope to see you again next week when we're going to take up one of the most interesting of the sections of our book, and that is The Mysterious Story of the Ten Bulls. This is the Zen Fable of Illumination. And I think it is one of the great classics of philosophic literature. Thank you very much.